Good afternoon, everyone. I am Margaret Wallace, board chair of Preservation Pennsylvania. I want to give a special welcome to our members and donors, and also welcome those who of you who are joining us for the first time. 2022 is a very exciting milestone for Preservation Pennsylvania as we take the time to not only look back over our first 40 years, but also to look ahead to our future. It has been my honor to serve on the board three separate times over our 40 year history. I have watched the organization grow, shrink and grow again to help people protect and preserve the places they love. At the end of today's program, we will share some of our 40th anniversary plans. In 2021, we selected two very deserving honor award recipients. We thought it would be a great way to start our anniversary by celebrating these two individuals. I want to especially thank our two honor award sponsors, Mrs. Henry Jordan and Roy Smith. Please feel free to use the chat function on Zoom to share your well wishes and congratulations to both Sadell and Jeff. We will share these comments with them after the program. This event is being recorded and will be available for replay on our website. And now let the celebration begin. Preservation Pennsylvania is the only statewide private nonprofit membership organization dedicated to the protection of historically and architecturally significant properties in Pennsylvania. The organization was created in 1982 by the Pennsylvania General Assembly as the Preservation Fund of Pennsylvania to operate a revolving fund that would assist in the acquisition and rehabilitation of historic properties. Since 1982, over 75 properties were assisted and the initial $400,000 fund has revolved four times. In 1985, the Preservation Fund of Pennsylvania merged with the Pennsylvania Trust for Historic Preservation, changing the name to Preservation Pennsylvania in 1990. Since that time, the organization has continued to serve the state through its programs, publishing the Pennsylvania At-Risk List and Annual List of Endangered Properties participates in educational programs and legislative and grassroots advocacy initiatives, manages revolving and intervention funds, and hosts an annual awards program. The Pennsylvania Historic Preservation Awards honors individuals and organizations that exhibit excellence in the field of historic preservation. In 2021, Preservation Pennsylvania honored two individuals for their work in preserving historic places. Henry Jordan was a passionate preservationist and a great friend of Preservation Pennsylvania. He was a member of the Board of Directors from 1987 to 1993, serving as the chairman from 1989 to 1992 and an advisor until his death in 2010. He willingly gave his time, advice, and encouragement and was a strong financial supporter of historic preservation. In keeping with Henry's belief that it is at the local level where real historic preservation occurs, the Henry A. Jordan Award recognizes outstanding historic preservation efforts at the local level. Sadell Zove has been working for more than five years to ensure that the future of a historic resource in Plymouth Meeting is secure. The Corson Homestead at the intersection of Butler and Germantown Pikes in White Marsh Township is a 10 and a half acre property that was a very busy stop on the Underground Railroad. George Corson and his wife, Martha Molesby Corson, were conductors on the railroad in addition to welcoming enslaved people into their home. In 2016, a national developer um, presented a plan to White Marsh Township to subdivide the property, take all the open space, all the fields, eight acres of fields, and develop that into a high-end townhouse community. After the developer presented their plans to White Marsh Township, Sadell and her colleagues knew that they must become involved. 
The Friends of Abolition Hall came together in January of 2016 in order to find a way to fight that plan to make it a better plan, not to keep the developer from doing anything on the site because we didn't think we would succeed in that regard, but to work with the developer, to cooperate with the developer in coming up with a better plan. Unfortunately, that was not able to happen. We, in fact, presented an alternative site plan and never got any traction for that. The group was initially successful in finding pro bono legal help as well as a local nonprofit to serve as their fiscal agent. A surprise came when Butler Pike was closed because of a series of sinkholes very common in this limestone-rich area. The United States Army Corps of Engineers completed an extensive study and determined that many of those sinkholes had become more like wetlands. Some of those sinkholes were permanently filled with water to the extent that they sustained aquatic life in the form of dragonfly nymphs and bullfrog tadpoles. And that was significant because it indicated that these sinkholes were more akin to wetlands than dry sinkholes. Not only did we have the potential for the degradation of this National Register historic site, but we had the obvious uh, potential for a degradation of uh, prist pristine, in many ways, um, and very special environmental um, aspects of the property. The Friends of Abolition Hall successfully nominated the site to the Preservation Pennsylvania's at-risk listing in 2017, and they were able to raise over $80,000 with Preservation Pennsylvania serving as their fiscal agent to cover the costs of legal representation. Because of our education and engagement and advocacy, we were able to turn heads and hearts at the local level in leadership, elected and appointed leadership, to the extent that in December 2019, the Planning Commission for White Marsh Township recommended that this plan not be approved, this townhouse plan not be approved. The Planning Commission decision in December 2019 was promising, but by January 2020, the developer indicated they would be submitting a revised plan. Sedell continued to check with the township every week through mid-2020. In July of 2020, I sent a written request for an update, may have been in the form of a right to know request, probably the 100th right to know request that I had filed with the township, not even counting the ones I'd filed with state agencies and federal agencies. And the answer I got back was that they had just, the township had just received a memo from counsel for the developer that they had terminated their agreement of sale and that they were pulling up stakes and leaving town. And that was a glorious moment. <laughs> the property is now under agreement of sale to White Marsh Township and a local organization called the White Marsh Community Arts Center. It will not be subdivided. Its fate is yet to be determined precisely, but it will be publicly owned and used for public purposes. We were able to encompass this wide diversity of people, create this welcoming organization that said, whatever brings you here, there is a place for you. Henry Jordan must have been a visionary <laughs> because as they say, all politics is local, all preservation is local. There is no question in my mind. When, when we started this effort, we leafleted. I didn't really know about social media at that point. I had no experience with Facebook at that point. We made hundreds of leaflets uh, and we delivered them through mail slots. We delivered them to people's hands. We, we gathered an army of volunteers who committed to knocking on every door in their neighborhood and we talked to people. That's how we started. That's how we built this effort. To be successful, it's a bottom-up effort. The F. Otto Haas Award memorializes a respected preservationist and philanthropist who was a founding member of Preservation Pennsylvania, a two-term chairman of the board, and a valued advisor until his death in 1994. 
His dedication to preservation Pennsylvania and to historic preservation in Pennsylvania still inspires us today. The F. Otto Haas Award recognizes contributions and consistent achievement above the standards of the professions. Jeff Marshall has been a lifelong advocate of both land conservation and historic preservation. During his tenure, the Heritage Conservancy facilitated preservation of over 15,000 acres of open space, farmland, wildlife habitat, and important watershed areas in Bucks and Montgomery counties. He's the author of six books on land protection and historic preservation, including Barns of Bucks County and Farmhouses of Bucks County, and is currently researching for a book on a late 19th, early 20th century builder in Newtown, Bucks County. I've worked the Heritage Conservancy for 40 years, and unlike most nonprofits that are either historic preservation or land conservation, the founders of our organization were recognized a long time ago. It's all part of the tapestry of what makes an area unique. So we don't parse historic from natural from farmland. It's all part of the tapestry and the character of the community we want to preserve. So personally, uh, being involved in protecting scenic views, protecting properties that are both natural or historic is what I'm proud of. And the one incident that comes to mind even now, many years later, is when my daughter was a teenager, I was driving her and two of her friends down on the road one day, and we passed a house that was scheduled to be in the middle of the development, and she, not knowing that I could hear, because teenage girls don't think parents in the front seat can hear, said, that building's there because my dad does what he does. To this date, that's the thing that I remember the most being proud of, being able to say that because of the efforts that I was involved with, not because of me, but that I had the pleasure or privilege to be part of, there are things here that future generations will enjoy. Upon his retirement, the Marshall Historic Preservation Fund has been established to ensure that the Heritage Conservancy can continue the important work that Jeff has been an ambassador for throughout his career, the dual mission of the preservation of both land and historic structures. Utilizing his expertise in agricultural heritage and architecture, Marshall is a co-founder of the Historic Barn and Farm Foundation of Pennsylvania, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing educational resources for the long-term preservation, protection, and documentation of historic barns in Pennsylvania and the agricultural heritage of the Commonwealth. Jeff shared the importance of not just advocating for preservation, but doing the work as well. Doing what we say we do is important but actually walking the walk is, is important. The property we're sitting at, my property, I actually bought from a developer who wanted to knock it down. And I thought that we really should do something different than that. And so he was coerced by the township, which had a strong preservation committee to engage somebody in evaluating the resources. So I came here and did it, and then showed it to my wife and she fell in love with it. And I eventually ended up buying it and now it is subject to a conservation easement on 11 acres which we own and a preservation easement on the buildings. A preservationist is a person who can look backwards and forward at the same time and be able to bring other people along with them. The only words of advice that I have for people trying to save any particular place, be it a historic building or, or natural uh, piece of land, is to be inclusive, to recognize that um, you can't mandate it. You have to get people educated, engaged, and enthusiastic. And it's not important to be right. It's important to get something done. I am privileged to have been raised in Bucks County and spent um, virtually my entire life here. And to be able to have worked in the community where I grew up is, is a thrill. And then to think that I've been able to make a difference is a thrill. And just to be honored for it is a complete surprise, and I am thrilled by the honor. Each year, our honor awards are handcrafted at the Moravian Pottery and Tile Works in Doylestown, a national historic landmark founded by Henry Chapman Mercer. The tiles produced here can be seen in many of Pennsylvania's historic buildings, including the Pennsylvania State Capitol. Congratulations to Preservation Pennsylvania Honor Award recipients, Jeff and Sidell.
I'm Jane Sheffield, a board member of Preservation Pennsylvania. Henry Jordan was a great friend and supporter. His passion for preservation was evident through his volunteer work with Preservation Pennsylvania, the Historic Preservation Trust of Vermont, where he spent his summers, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. He was a delight, and his death in 2010 is still felt today. To honor his legacy and his belief that the real preservation work happens at the local level, this award was created in his name. His wife, Barbara, has been a sponsor of the award each year, and we thank her for her support. It is my honor to introduce you to the 2021 Henry A. Jordan Award recipient, Zadell Zo. Zadell has spent years working in the nonprofit sector, primarily for organizations with social justice missions, affordable housing, community development, food access, and workers' rights. She has always been active in civic matters, serving as chairperson of her neighborhood association when she lived in Germantown, and more recently on the board of directors of her local public library in White Marsh Township. As you learned in the video, she has spent the last six years leading a passionate group of people in a grassroots campaign to find a better outcome and design for a proposed townhouse development that would threaten the Plymouth Meeting Historic District, Pennsylvania's first National Register Historic District, and more importantly, Abolition Hall and several other buildings that were a well-documented stop on the Underground Railroad. In 2020, when the builder withdrew its land development application, and again, nine months later, when White Marsh Township announced it would purchase a property, Zadell and the community celebrated the news. She will remain vigilant and continue her work to raise awareness about a county transportation planning study that revived a recommendation to realign the historic crossroads and potentially threaten the site again. We celebrate her tenacity and grace under pressure. Congratulations, Sadell. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Sabra. Uh, this is indeed an honor. And I accept this award on behalf of the Friends of Abolition Hall. As our fiscal sponsor and technical assistance provider, Preservation Pennsylvania made it possible for us to persevere despite the significant odds. I really must thank a number of people and organizations for their support in getting us to this place, for helping us tell this story of the, help of the homestead's history and the challenges we faced in opposing the will of a national real estate developer. I wanna thank Patrick Dolan, a videographer, Nathaniel Popkin, Bradley Mall, and Michael Bixler of Hidden City Philadelphia, the Preservation Alliance for Greater Philadelphia, George McNeely, of the Chestnut Hill Local, Inga Saffron, architecture critic of the, Chess of the Philadelphia Inquirer, attorney Michael Kord, radio and TV host, columnist for the Philadelphia Tribune, and founding member of Avenging the Ancestors, and the national NAACP, as well as its, as well as its Pottstown chapter, um, to friends from the art and historic preservation worlds. Bill Bolger, Mary Werner Denedi, and Aaron Wunsch for serving as pro bono expert witnesses. Deepest appreciation to you. To Paul Stanky, William Valerio, and Faye Anderson. For his environmental expertise, James Schmidt, the granddaddy of wetland scientists. To our corporate and foundation donors, Subaru of North America, the Gates Foundation, and to our, one of our earliest supporters, the White Marsh Foundation, with a special nod to Hugh Moulton. To our state elected officials, rep, many thanks to Representative Mary Jo Daly, to Senator Vincent Hughes, and to Representative Chris Rapp. To the White Marsh Township Board of Supervisors, who committed open space funds for the acquisition of the homestead 
and with a very special thank you to Laura Boyle Nestor and Vince Manuel for their leadership. Most importantly, to current and former residents and others with deep connections to our community. These are just a few of the people whose participation was pivotal. And I hope you're listening. David and Bonnie Miller, Linda and Tom Dahl, Dave Contasta, Celine Childs, Richard Abraham, Robin Smith, Diane and Lib Boyle, Steve Guerra, MJ Fisher, Skip Corson, Tina Corson Krause, Carol Corson, Johnny Corson, Nels Sandberg, and Father James Martin. Finally, while we are celebrating this grassroots preservation success, we cannot lose sight of the extraordinary people whose feet touch this hallowed land. It's not the architecture that is exemplary. Rather, it is the bold deeds of the Malsby and Corson families in response to immoral laws and to the bravery and determination of enslaved African-Americans who fled north in search of freedom. We have much to learn and to teach, and that must be the primary role of the Corson homestead. Now more than ever, as hard-won voting rights are threatened, good people need to take a stand, just as the Molesby and Corson families did in fighting the ab ab abomination of slavery. We need to participate here in Pennsylvania and nationally, where voter suppression initiatives are well underway. I'll leave you with this thought. While I am honored and humbled to receive the Henry A. Jordan Award, the work is far from over. I hope each of us can take inspiration from these heroes and honor their legacy by also being brave and bold. Many, many thanks to everyone who helped us over the course of six years. And I might add that today, January 6th, 26th, is indeed the sixth anniversary of um, the developer's first public appearance before the, before the residents of White Marsh Township, before the Planning Commission in 2016. Thank you very much. Yes, good afternoon. I'm Roy Smith, Secretary and Treasurer of the Board of Preservation Pennsylvania. It's my honor to introduce today's F. Otto Haas Award winner for 2021, Jeffrey Marshall. As the video you saw earlier uh, mentioned, Otto Haas was a founding member of Preservation Pennsylvania and served board both as the chair of the board and advisor until his death. He was a passionate preservationist and a strong supporter of Preservation Pennsylvania's work. This award recognizes the contributions and consistent achievement by the recipient that it goes above and beyond the standards of the profession. I'm honored to be a member of the special group of 32 previous Haas Award recipients and to welcome Jeff Marshall as the newest member of the group. As, was, as you saw in the video, Jeff has worked for 40 years with the Heritage Conservancy in Bucks County, the last 10 of which as its president. For 40 years, he has promoted the value of open space and historic preservation. Upon his recent retirement, as noted, the Conservancy established the Marshall Historic Preservation Fund to continue this important work. He is the author of six books on historic architecture, local history, and historic preservation, and is mentioned as the co-founder of the Historic Barn and Farm Foundation of Pennsylvania. In his retirement, he will be continuing his writing and research to further the understanding of Pennsylvania's rural history. In addition to his professional work, Jeff also lives the lifestyle that he promotes by continuing work on his farm in Bucks County. Jeff also served on the board of directors of Preservation Pennsylvania, so it feels like we are honoring one of our own. Congratulations, Jeff, on an impressive career and receiving this year's F. Otto Haas Award. Thank you very much, Roy. Um, a couple of technical difficulties here, but uh, uh, I just want to start by thanking everybody um, that I've ever met in the last 40 years. Now, uh, I want to thank my colleagues, my family, Preservation Pennsylvania, and the many people who have really built the preservation movement in Pennsylvania. 
we all are part of that continuum and we hope to make it continue for many more generations to come. I think receiving what amounts to a lifetime achievement award puts um, one in an awkward position. Um, it's difficult to really show the great respect and appreciation of the honor of being bestowed while maintaining an appropriate amount of humility. And it's easy for me to do that because I recognize that for most of my career, I have been a representative of an organization, um, not unlike Preservation PA, that really is designed to preserve what we think is special about our community. I'm flattered that the award is for doing things well, not just for a long period of time. Um, and I am again humbled and honored to, to receive it. I think uh, historic preservation and preservation of historic structures is more than an appreciation of architecture or even our heritage. Historic preservation to me is a way we connect people to the places that have an impact and places that they cherish. When done successfully, activating people to make a difference is really what we're all about. Um, you heard the story during the video about my daughter uh, when she was a preteen, but I have two other short stories I'd like to relate that really reflect on what I think is important about the work we do. One is that I was at a program to celebrate farmland preservation and a gentleman who had lived on a centennial farm, been in his family for however many generations. Um, and while it's land conservation, it really, it really is a point that I want to make is that he said after receiving um, his plaque for preserving the farm, it was probably during some big event. Um, he said, except for the day I got married and the birth of my children, today is the most important day of my life. I can say thank you to my ancestors and do something for my descendants. Um, it was a, you know, a chilling moment for me to realize that what we do is so important to so many people. And we just don't often hear that kind of response. And the other thing that I heard when doing a project that we were told was impossible uh, time and time again was when one gentleman said, if you pull this off, no one will know who you are, but in 200 years, you'll be heroes. And that's the type of thing that keeps many of us preservationists going um, during the, the hard times. Um, and I am proud that many of the images you saw in the video stand today and will stand for future generations because of the preservation movement, because people got involved and people wanted to make a difference. Um, so that's what makes our community special. And you saw a great variety of buildings and structures and open spaces, all of which, as you know, mentioned in the video, form the tapestry of what makes Bucks County and Southeast Pennsylvania and all of Pennsylvania so special. So um, it is really um, important that we pass the torch. Uh, Sadell used the term, get people's heads and hearts behind what we do. That's critically important. And that's what I have learned over the past few years as I am ending my career to try to pass on the, the advice, the lessons learned uh, over the years. Um, and when you get old, I think people start to ask you for advice. And um, a couple of things I have always tried to say is one is when you get involved in a project, always try to find a solution. Uh, don't be completely dogmatic. I think imperfect victories are much more important most of the time than noble defeats especially when you're dealing with historic structures. You get one bite of the apple. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. Sometimes compromise and protecting the resource, even if it's not totally the way you want it to do it, is better than not preserving it at all. And to do that, as again, Sadell had noted, uh, you have to create an atmosphere that finding a solution doesn't have to be completely adversarial all the time. Even when you start at opposite ends of a position with people, creating an atmosphere where people trust you, trust your word, trust that you have uh, everyone's interest in heart, although they know where your uh, perspective really is, um, really is critical in making things successful. 
And finally, I always tell people, bring both passion and professionalism to every project. There's nothing wrong with showing people you care. And so with that, um, again, I want to um, you know, thank everybody who has involved in, in this award. Again, I was surprised and completely flattered by it and I'm honored and humbled by it. And I am proud to join the 32 true giants of the field who have uh, gotten this award in the previous year. Thank you very much. Congratulations to Dale and Jeff. Your work is an inspiration to us all. And now I am very excited to introduce our keynote speaker. In anticipation of our 40th anniversary, Preservation Pennsylvania recently approved a new strategic plan. As we worked on the event to kick off our anniversary celebration, we, we knew we wanted a speaker who would inspire us not only to look back, but also to look forward and to challenge us in how to think about historic preservation as we move forward. Bonnie McDowell aspires to shape preservation into a more relevant and just practice. As president and CEO of Landmarks Illinois, Bonnie advances the vision, mission, and programs of Illinois' only statewide preservation nonprofit organization. Her transformative thinking about preservation has led the organization to focus its work on people and their important connection to historic places. She is currently spearheading the organization's evolution as it celebrates 50 years to enhance its relevance and to create a national model for justice, equity, inclusion, and diversity in the preservation practice. Bonnie is a collaborative leader and together with her board, team, and volunteers have nearly doubled LI staff, opened its first regional office, passed vital state legislation, and played a visible role as thought leaders during her nine years as president. From 2018 to 2021, Bonnie served as the board chair of the National Preservation Partners Network, the national nonprofit representing preservation organizations. And she was awarded the James Marston Fitz Charitable Foundation Mid-Career Fellowship in 2020 to write a guidebook to relevancy in the preservation movement. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot appointed Bonnie co-chair of the Chicago Monuments Project in 2020 to help lead a truth and racial reckoning process in the city around problematic artworks. Bonnie received a bachelor's degree in art history from the University of Minnesota and a master's degree in historic preservation planning from Cornell University. Bonnie is exactly the inspiration we need as we embark on our 20th anniversary. At any time during Bonnie's talk, feel free to go type a question into the chat or to use the question and answer function. We have left time at the end for questions. Please welcome Bonnie McDonald. Margaret, thank you so very much for that warm introduction on an albeit cold day uh, coming to you from Chicago, everyone. So it's such a pleasure to be with you and really to be a part of this wonderful celebration on the, of the 40th anniversary of Preservation Pennsylvania. So let me make sure that you get a good view of the presentation here and I'm excited to talk with you about this. Um, it's a true pleasure to be here with you and to be talking about a project that I've been working on for several years with many, many people, um, as is the work of Preservation Pennsylvania. So I just want to take a moment to, to truly thank Margaret, uh, the Board of Preservation Pennsylvania, and Mindy for this invitation to talk about this project. And also, I'd like to congratulate them for their 40th anniversary and to congratulate the award winners, Seidel and Jeff, you are an inspiration just hearing you today. Uh, you are giving us wisdom and showing us how we can improve this work, how we can make our work more relevant. So thank you for being an inspiration to me in this presentation as well. I would also like to take a moment to say thank you to my colleague and my friend, Minnie Crawford, for her leadership, for her vision, uh, her creativity and her dedication. This, this work can be very difficult, as many of you know, and Mindy continues to press forward uh, with her dedication to Preservation Pennsylvania. So I just wanna say thank you to her for this honor and let her know that she is an inspiration to me as well. 
So that word relevance it comes up quite a bit in our daily life. We hear about things being relevant or irrelevant. And depending on what it is at any one moment, it could be relevant at one time and the next day it is deemed irrelevant. Um, that is usually in the context of social media or if we're talking about the latest trend. But the project that I've worked on is really not about trends and it's not about even being socially acceptable as you see this definition here. Why I wanted to look at preservation is to see truly how applicable it is going to continue to be in the future. I do believe that preservation has been a relevant practice for the hundred plus years that we have been helping people save places around this nation and of course people around the world. But I've observed in my own 20 plus year career in historic preservation, the challenges that we just continue to face uh, some of those that you've heard about in the video today, and I'm sure that you've seen in Preservation Pennsylvania's news alerts and, and uh, newsletters as well. So my observations are really that preservation is not always the right solution to a problem. And I, I think Jeff noted in his acceptance speech that you know sometimes we have that, that noble loss instead of the compromise victory. And at times, as I've noticed in my career, preservation could even be part of the problem. And that has deeply concerned me as these observations have just cumulatively pointed out the change that is needed in preservation in my belief. And truly what I have come to feel is a relevancy crisis in our organization in uh, preservation practice. So I, I, in this presentation, I do want to illustrate for you, give you some specifics. As we talk about strategy, I also want to get into the tactical so that you can understand even further my concerns. This is an example here of a project that we worked on at Landmarks Illinois called the Harley Clark Mansion. It's located in Evanston, Illinois. Some of you may have heard of that, uh, the location of Northwestern University. And this building is a local landmark. It is an, a listed in the National Register of Historic Places, and it's owned by the city of Evanston itself. And here we were facing the city trying to demolish its own landmark uh, when it became vacant and the city really lacked creativity, uh, lacked drive in trying to find an adaptive reuse. And it's just indicative of, as I said, this cumulative list of things that I've noticed over this history uh, in my career. And, you know, some of those include, for example, not only seeing cities trying to demolish their own landmarks, but cities uh, devaluing or actually denigrating their own preservation ordinances. Uh, some of them trying to abolish them entirely. Uh, we see places trying to delist historic districts, uh, the decimation of our incentives. As we know, we've had to fight to keep the federal historic tax credit several times. We lost the 10% historic or non-historic tax credit. Uh, we also have seen the budgets cut at our state historic preservation offices, at least in our region here in the Midwest. And many of our preservation partners have really struggled to make ends meet financially. And from that, we have a large degree of burnout, unfortunately, in our field as well. So these, you add these together over time and it leads one to be concerned. I just wanna say this is not a presentation about hopelessness, not at all, I'll end on a hopeful note, but it is to say that I was inspired to do something about it to the degree that I can. And it's the people that I work with that truly inspire me to take steps forward. Those people like Seidel and Jeff and Mindy and Margaret who decide to take steps on their own to be bold, to be brave, and to fight for the things that we feel are important to people, um, people's right to place essentially. And here I list out uh, one of the advocates for the Harley Clark Mansion, uh, Carl Klein, who is a member of our Skyline Council of Landmarks Illinois, which is our young leaders group. And uh, thankfully we were able to get the support of our Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic, Blair Kamen from Chicago Tribune, who said, hey, Evanston, wake up. This is, you can do better than this. And through a long advocacy campaign over five years, we were able to save the Harley Clark Mansion. And now it's being reused by author Audrey Niffenegger as something called the Book House. So this one has a very positive end, but it just illuminated those challenges that I mentioned to you. And so, as I mentioned, we each need to step forward to do what we can to address these challenges in preservation, 
uh, to find ways for it to evolve if we believe that indeed these problems are real and to do what we can to find the next evolution for it to be relevant. You know, for me, what inspired me is not only, you know, sitting back and counting these things, but saying that I have a responsibility to do something about it. Though these challenges are huge and sometimes really difficult to think how you might actually uh, address affordable housing crises, how, how you might address um, the, the political matters around historic preservation ordinances. What can you do to take a step forward? So I just want to say that, that I was really inspired by this book, and I would encourage you all to read it if you haven't. It's called Be Fearless uh, by Jean Case of the Case Foundation, and it's about leaders who have gone beyond their comfort zone to do incredible things, to be bold and to be fearless, like Seidel and like Jeff. So this work really matters. And if we are going to do something about it, we have to be bold. And so I really developed a thought of uh, how I was going to do that. And I'm going to pepper into this presentation, everybody, some inspirational quotes from this book. And I hope they'll continually inspire you as uh, we come to the end of this presentation to, to take your own steps forward. What I decided to do to move forward was really to identify if I was the only one seeing these problems. Uh, I didn't want to assume that every place has the same issues in preservation or that everybody sees what I saw. Um, so I said, I'm going to go talk to people. And thankfully, this was our 50th anniversary, as I mentioned, in 2021. We were preparing to celebrate this anniversary. And our board of directors and my team said, yes, we want to use this moment as a mandate to look at our future uh, and to find out what we need to do to evolve as an organization. And so I asked if I could take a two-week sabbatical, essentially, and was fortunate to receive a grant from the National Trust for Historic Preservation's Peter H. Brink Mentoring Fund. And for two weeks, I traveled to 14 states and interviewed 23 people to ask these questions. Are you seeing the same thing? Um, is this solely in the Midwest or is this on the East Coast, the South? Is it in the Northeast? Um, and what I found from that is that, yes, the things that I was seeing, really other people were seeing, but they also had challenges that went beyond what I saw in my region. But they also had very creative solutions to these problems. And as I learned, they didn't know what somebody in Pennsylvania was doing in Los Angeles um, or in New York City, what was happening in New Orleans, because we're spending so much time as preservationists trying to solve the issue, trying to put out the fire, that we don't have time to look for the solution oftentimes. And it's such a big problem at times, it makes us wonder how we can even chip away at it. So the, the lesson I learned was that it would really be helpful to this field if we had a location, if we had a guidebook to the solutions that people were using to solve these issues. So I asked if I could continue this work. And thankfully, the James Marston Fitch Charitable Foundation out of Columbia University awarded me their 2020 Mid-Career Fellowship, as Margaret mentioned. And that was an incredible gift to be given the, the sanction, essentially, that this work was important and resources to continue this research. And I will tell you, the people I talked to were so generous. They continued to identify who else I should speak with. It's like, well, they tell two people and they call two people and you need to call this person. And eventually 23 interviews turned into 130 um, over a two year period. And I'll have to say that certainly COVID-19 gave us incredible challenges and difficulties at the nonprofit sector. But what it did do for me in this project is it introduced me to Zoom like this. I didn't use it before. And it helped me to actually talk with far more people than I would have if I had to fly hither and yon to talk with every person. Plus, it's a much more environmental solution. So I'm just giving you a snapshot of some of the people that I spoke to. But I want to say thank you to the 130 people who donated their time to this uh, to this project and for spending hours of their time with me to discuss how we can evolve preservation. And I'll go through some of the key findings in just a moment coming out of these interviews. So additionally, I want to say, you know, who, who, were, who was being interviewed? So you saw some photos of them. I just wanted to say that it was important to me to talk to a wide range of people who were both, let's say, inside and outside of preservation. Because it's not only what we think about ourselves, it's also what others perceive of us that is going to drive the future of this field. And so 
I also wanted to craft this as a way to hear from voices that are often not heard in preservation, those who have been marginalized in our work, oftentimes people of color, LGBTQ community, young people, uh, people of different socioeconomic status. Uh, so I tried to make sure we had equal. So about half of those voices are people we might not hear from or have, haven't driven decisions that were made in the past. You might ask, and it's a very good question about something called confirmation bias. So if there are any social scientists out there, I'm sure you're writing that in the chat right now. And co confirmation bias is essentially when you pick out interview subjects that are just gonna confirm what you already think. And so it's important to me to be cognizant that that exists and in talking with people to make sure that I was identifying a range of perspectives. So in this project, there are those who believe preservation is very good as it is and might need a few tweaks. And those who go all the way to the other side who think it needs to be completely dismantled and we need to start all over again. So there was everybody in between uh, to ensure that this was really a wide ranging and as unbiased as possible look at preservation. But ultimately to a person, everyone felt that there were changes that needed to be made in our practice and preservation practice. So I wanted to spend the majority of my time talking about these key findings and getting your feedback from, uh, from this process. And what it continues to lead to, of course, are more questions. I just wanna say this project is not done. And what I learn in every time I talk about it is that there are just more questions that we need to answer. Uh, but what's important is that we just get started. Uh, it is important to take steps forward and to take what we've learned um, through your feedback and find ways that each one of us can take a step forward. So the findings really fall into four different areas that I've listed out here for you. And essentially what it comes down to in my mind is that we need to expand who is involved in making decisions around place in our communities. Uh, that we need to ensure that this work is done uh, fairly, justly, and that it meets people where they are, not necessarily where we want them to be. That we need to be more of a solution for the critical issues that are facing humanity. Uh, this is not to say that we are not a solution, but we believe, many of us, that we could do more. Uh, we can be more and partner with more people to solve these humanity crises that we have. And finally, that we need to build our next generation of leaders in preservation. There are many who are retiring in, in our field and uh, we don't have time to do session planning. So I'm gonna cover some of the specific points that have been raised and just note that this is coming from 130 different people, uh, but 300 pages of notes actually from those interviews. So there's a lot in there that I won't be able to cover as well. But I think these are the most important things. So building an inclusive and accessible preservation movement. We note, uh, if you have ever been a manager, for example, that the most diverse teams are the strongest that we can actually make better decisions. We, we have different perspectives around the table. And I believe that's absolutely true in preservation, that the diversity of our field is actually going to make our impact stronger. And that we'll be able to do, I think, what many of us want to, which is help people save the places that are special to them, that are about their history and their identity. And that may be a place that's very different from one that's been surveyed before. We need to find more information have help identifying places that are important to others, expand the definition of preservation, and also um, engage people in making decisions about what they feel is important. Um, so it was identified, you know, early surveys that were done in preservation were uh, oftentimes just based on architecture, based on what we could see. That's what the windshield survey was. And oftentimes we're missing that time to go and do the historic research so that we can learn what stories may be embedded in the place. And also that the, the lexicon of importance, architectural and, and aesthetic importance is coming from Western, a Western mentality. Um, and that may not be indicative of what other communities feel is beautiful or important as well. So how do we expand our definition of what is significant? We need to embrace, of course, more, more, uh, more people in this process to also ensure that there's a, a future uh, for the, the incentives that we have, the regulatory, the public policy, uh, because more voices around the table help to improve that legislation so that everybody can be involved. 
And we recognize not all of those regulations are understandable. Not all of them are, are accessible. That language can be Byzantine uh, when you try to read it. And they oftentimes need people like Preservation Pennsylvania or Landmarks Illinois to help understand what it all means. And to do a much better job, we need to break down that system so it's much easier to understand so people don't need to go through us, even though we want to be helpful, that they don't need to because we end up being gatekeepers uh, oftentimes to resources. So that language and communication is important as you know, words matter as you hear. And I wanted to give you an example of this that was very prominent in the last year and a half here in Chicago, for example. So the very words that we use can be detrimental and offensive to how people view historic preservation. I'm showing you a picture of the proposed Obama Presidential Center, which is uh, uh, proposed for Jackson Park, which is listed on the National Register for Historic Places. It's an Olmsted landscape where the uh, 1893 World's Fair took place. And here, the proposed Obama Presidential Center is, of, of course, seen as a real boon to this city, and especially on the south side of Chicago, where President Obama made his mark as a community organizer. There has been a regulatory review process uh, through Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, and the point of that is to bring lots of people together to talk about the, the impact, positive and negative, of proposed projects. So here, I was at a public meeting where it was noted that this is considered an adverse effect to the historic park. And there was a public comment about how offensive that language was, not recognizing, of course, that you know, to us, that's language that's just something we use on a daily basis in regulation, but that by calling something so significant to a population of people who elected President Obama, uh, that actually that was a negative connotation automatically for historic preservation. The language matters. To create an equitable preservation movement, sorry, I got, I'm trying to block out the sun, everybody. The sun finally showed here in Chicago today. So to build an equitable preservation movement, there, there needs to be recognition that basic human needs need to be met before preservation can be a priority. I just had this conversation with a, a former preservation planner here in the city, recognizing that we may want to come in and make preservation the priority, uh, but if, if housing needs are difficult and challenging and there isn't uh, access to safe and affordable housing, that is most likely going to be the priority. How do we contribute to a solution uh, so that we can build pre a preservation solution around housing, for example, affordable housing and preservation oftentimes can go hand in hand. Meeting people where they are, just talking about that conversation about adverse effect is recognizing that uh, that preservationists uh, tend to have a lot of jargon, uh, that it can be, again, Byzantine to go through our regulations. How do we help simplify that process? Not dumb it down, but just make sure that the language is clear and that people can find information on their own as well. And that there's self-determination in the community about what they want to preserve. Uh, so here, oftentimes it's planning departments, it might be the State Historic Preservation Office, it may be um, you know, the uh, zoning department that is looking at how the future of land use is going to be in a community and not the community itself that's making a decision. So that's very important to many of those that I interviewed. So, Preservation has a tie, as I was just mentioning for land use, I was going to articulate this last point. Uh, preservation is tied to land use policy. And of course, it's an overlay zoning for most historic districts, if that's how, um, how they're called in your community. So here, I'm bringing you a photo of a social justice artist named Tanika Lewis Johnson. And she is working on the south side of Chicago in the Englewood neighborhood to identify what was an inequitable and really illegal practice of land use or land sale contracts, uh, which I won't go into the definition of those, but it was essentially the plunder of black wealth in Chicago and elsewhere. And she wanted to landmark one of these buildings as indicative of the significance in cultural history and beginning to repair this, having reparations uh, for this unjust practice, illegal practice essentially, and was told by some of the commissioners on the Landmarks Commission that it would, it would not be eligible because of our criteria. And so she created a land marker system. That's what you see here. She's putting up a land marker so that she can identify this as significant. And right there is, is an example of how we, we would want historic preservation to embrace 
his, the cultural relevance of this practice and helping to repair that history. Solving critical issues, the one that comes up the most, of course, is how we can contribute even more to combating climate change and the uh, practice of environmental justice for those who have been uh, systematically uh, targeted for polluting practices, for example, that has a land use implication, and oftentimes those are historic neighborhoods as well. Uh, looking at what any way that we can provide better access to housing through historic preservation and looking at how we may contribute, do we contribute to displacement and gentrification? Many of those I interviewed either have evidence or believe that, uh, that historic districts may contribute to uh, displacement in our communities. So we need to know the facts of that and then address it from a policy standpoint. Uh, I also want to bring up, these are, these are not all urban issues. The, the, um, the concerns, I talked with many rural communities, I, I spoke with tribal representatives, and depopulation is a significant concern that has an impact on the resources, the historic bu building resources uh, in a community. So depopulation is something that, that threatens the built environment and of course people's interaction and connection with that built environment. So in what ways are we contributing to, to um, combating depopulation or helping to ensure that the intellectual um, the you know intellectual capacity, the, that brain drain that happens, uh, you reverse that so that rural communities have a fighting chance as well. I just wanted to point out one uh, one issue that we deal with here at Landmarks Illinois is that's climate change related is with the Farnsworth House uh, by Mies van der Rohe. We have a easement on this property, and the um, uh, the easement, of course, is protecting the building, but the, it is adjacent to the Fox River, which continues to flood and actually is flooding more frequently at the 500 year flood mark. So there's conversation about lifting it out of the way. Do you move it, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just indicative of conversations I know that are happening all around the coasts uh, as water sea level rise is happening. And what do we do to protect the culturally significant, historically significant resources that are going to be underwater. That's just one of the aspects of preservation that we feel we need to address to be more relevant. And finally, sustaining the future of our work, we identify that we need education for all ages, uh, from little kids to adults. And uh, talking about the significance and importance of place to people and why preserving place is significant. We don't always communicate that in a way that's effective, unfortunately. And hopefully we can get more people interested in this work because we need to build a bigger constituency around preservation. So it's not seen as a luxury, it's seen as a necessity. And training more people in doing the work. So even if we're able to preserve a place, we may not have somebody skilled at that thing that needs to be done. Uh, so working on preservation trades training, which is a significant aspect of uh, the National Impact Agenda, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and also the National Preservation Partners are working on uh, preservation trades training policy as well. Uh, we have to address funding uh, because this hand in mouth approach for preservation organizations just leads us to make decisions that are based on resources and where we can find them. Uh, we don't always make the most strategic decisions if we're always just looking for how to pay our payroll. Um, in addition to that, the Historic Preservation Fund, which pays for our state historic preservation offices, our national register program, our certified local government program, is funded by offshore oil lease revenues. And how sustainable is that funding source in the long-term future? So that is a conversation I know that is being had at the federal level, and we need to continue to talk about a replacement source of funding for our preservation policy and regulators. Finally, you know, I talked about burnout. We, we've seen a number of uh, executive directors, our, uh, you know, the rest of our team um, uh, during the great resignation, bowing out of preservation work, and they're not alone as, as more and more people retire out of the field as well. How are we planning to ensure that that institutional memory is passed on to somebody else and that we light a fire in the next generation to take on this important work as well? And here's a picture of our Skyline Council of Landmarks, Illinois. This is how we're trying to contribute. We have this incredible group of, of emerging or young professionals that are, uh, have agency within our organization to make their own decisions about what they want to do, what they want to preserve. 
Uh, here they are in front of the Harley Clark mansion going back mansion going back to the beginning of my speech where they held a heart bombing and a heart bombing is where they show some love for a vacant building and help to demonstrate that there was a significant amount of support behind preservation, thus leading the city to understand that they had political pressure to reuse this building. So the next steps in the relevancy project, the project that I've talked about, is essentially to take all of, of this data, this information, and, and continue to analyze it and put it forward in blog posts so that I continue to share this to gather feedback, constructive criticism, and then integrate that feedback into the creation of the relevancy guidebook. So the guidebook is going to essentially have a number of practical solutions that a person can take, small steps that you can take forward to addressing these big issues. Because otherwise, if, if you feel like it's a big, hairy problem that's so big you can't tackle it, we are going to be paralyzed from moving forward. We just have to take a step forward. And so there are many you know, wonderful organizations that are working at the policy level to change preservation uh, between the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions that Mindy uh, is on the board on, uh, the National Trust I mentioned, and their National Impact Agenda, the Partners Network with their Preservation Priorities Task Force, we have academics that I want to say thank you to, Erica Avrami, uh, uh, Jeremy Wells, um, uh, Sam, uh, let's see, um, uh, Fallon Samuels, I do in New Orleans, um, as well as Randy Mason at um, Penn University, who are all working toward that policy solution. What I hope to contribute with this guidebook was really some small steps. Instead of policy level, how do we pair that with the practical, where you can take a step based on where you where you are in your organization, how what's the readiness to move forward with these items, and uh, just publishing some ideas for people. So at this point, we've got about 120 ideas uh, in a running list, and it just continues to grow as I analyze those um, interviews with the with the interviewees. So I just wanted to show you a couple of those that we have started to take at Landmarks Illinois that are you know very possible to move forward with. Uh, publishing our values. We put together something called our guiding principles that we've published on our website that you can see, or I can put it in the chat later. You know, building boards and staff that are representative of the communities we serve. You know, evaluating our procurement practices. We did something called a spend diagnostic, looking at where our money goes and how we can use even our small amount of money to encourage the growth of diverse contractors who can continually contribute to the uh, intellectual uh, capital within preservation, for example, those the knowledge base uh, and those working in preservation. Just a couple of others. I know Sarah Marsum, one of, one of my interviewees would want us to say, pay your interns. It's very important to make sure that there's pay equity in preservation, we're paying our interns. And also she would say, make sure we're publishing the uh, the salaries on all of our job descriptions as well. But further, making sure we have diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility training and certification that we're offering, uh, joining the Climate Heritage Network, which is a very easy step you can take. So these are all individual, uh, individual uh, concepts that you can move forward with at your organization or as an individual. So I'm looking forward to publishing this, hopefully later this year, so that together we can take steps to fix preservation. As I worked toward publishing this information, I had a hashtag called Let's Fix Preservation. And it was my way to say that I do think preservation is fixable. I do think that we have the capacity to evolve into the next relevant version of what preservation needs to be if we all take steps to do that together. And I'll end with this proverb, which is in, in the book, Be Fearless Again, which I highly encourage that we all have to work on this together. It can't be one person who changes a movement. We need to be a movement who are changing ourselves because if we don't, somebody else will. Um, but I'm very hopeful that together we will be able to do this as a community and you know, ultimately help people save places that matter to them. So I wanna thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and your feedback. I just wanna say thank you. This is a moment for me to give credit to our annual corporate sponsors who sponsor everything we do at Landmarks Illinois. And uh, 
they really deserve credit amongst those who are individual donors to our organization. That do, those donations are so important to us. And I just wanna put a pitch in to please support Preservation Pennsylvania with your gifts. Uh, Mindy and Sabra and the board need your support so that they can continue to implement that new and exciting strategic plan that they just talked about. I'm, I'm ending with this slide. This is my contact information. And I'm happy to hear from you. I've got my Twitter handle. I have my cell phone, uh, my, uh, my email address. So you can find this information on our website as well at landmarks.org to hear your feedback. If, if you want to consider this, contemplate it a little further, I will give the presentation to Sabra so she can publish it as well. And um, you, know, you can come back later with your comments if you're not ready to do so today. Um, so again, thank you so much, and I am looking forward to the Q&A session, Mindy. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Uh, it's, it's actually great to be here sharing a screen with you. Bonnie and I go a long way back, but when I started at Preservation Pennsylvania in 2006, Bonnie was the executive director of uh, the Preservation Statewide in Minnesota, and we had a little bet going. Uh, both of our organizations and our states had been trying for many years, 15, 14 years at that time, to establish our first state historic tax credit. So Bonnie and I made a little bet to see which one of us was going to make it first. She, she did win. She won in 2010. We had ours eventually um, enacted in 2012. And I promised I was going to knit her a sweater. Um, sorry, still haven't gotten that sweater. <laughs> That's all right, Mindy. You know, we passed a tax credit in Illinois as well. So I just wanted to, uh, to say that, at, you know, any place we go, we need to pass tax credits. Yes. So, so Bonnie, you, I know you said you have 120 ideas, but if, if you could say, you know, what is one thing, what's the call to action? What is one thing an individual can do to, to sort of start this process of, of fixing preservation? I, I would advise that you just consider where where you feel preservation is in your you know your profession or your life and uh, decide who you would like to work with and that can often help you who who can you partner with like a preservation Pennsylvania of course to leverage your volunteerism or your resources to have an even greater impact um, so it's important to have numbers in this process and uh, talk with you, I, I'm plugging for Preservation Pennsylvania, um, to plug the strategic plan and take steps to encourage that strategic plan to go forward. Um, otherwise, you know, beyond just uh, joining an organization and their efforts, um, I really think it's important to have a voice in preservation, and that is often whether that's your local government, whether that's your Congress people, uh, talking with um, even local banks about the importance of having financing for this work, you know, just making your voice heard in some way. Okay, thank you. Um, it's interesting that um, both uh, Sidel and Jeff mentioned turning hearts and minds. So my uh, question before I turn to some of the others that we received is what's your advice for reaching new hearts and minds? Mm -hmm. There are many ways to do that. And why I say that not, is not to, uh, not to skirt the issue, everybody, but to say that it's really important to uh, take a moment to understand with whom you're speaking and to take a moment to step back and listen. Uh, so the person with whom you're engaging uh, may be coming to preservation or this conversation from a very different perspective than you are. And that's the meeting people where they are. So uh, being able to identify the um, you know, the, the, the approach as far as language that, you know, we might use um, and what may be important to that person. That's how we change hearts and minds. It's not by saying we're important, you know, preservation is relevant. It's really about uh, stepping back, being humble, listening, and when a community identifies what they want and need, that's what we should do. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have some questions rolling in now. Um, in cities and places that are experiencing growth and intense development pressure, how did interviewees gauge appetite for density and rezoning within the context of historic preservation? Sure. Th thanks for that question, because I, I do want to recognize that 
you know, I spoke with people in many of the country's large cities, and, and certainly there's a diversity of issues that they're facing. Um, <clears throat> even within my own city of Chicago, uh, there's not one, you know, one uh, uh, problem that we have in every neighborhood. There are different problems within different neighborhoods. I, what I would say, though, is that with regard to the, the quote unquote hot areas of a city, and you know, especially on um, the the east or the west coast, excuse me, uh, that dense the the integration of density is a very important step forward for preservation. If we can adopt a mentality that that density is not bad, um, and that is because there's a group called the Yes in My Backyard. So YIMBY, you might have heard NIMBY before, not in my backyard. So YIMBYs uh, want to embrace any way to create affordable housing. And that includes densifying single family dist uh, residential districts. And when we, uh, when we come at that and say no, no, no to all density, it really does position us as the movement of no, and that we oftentimes are considered that we don't care about affordable housing or housing access. So I would just say the one thing to, to look at or that we've learned about uh, is the um, accessory dwelling unit legislation. So we have that in Chicago. This is where you can increase the number of housing units on a piece of land without necessarily uh, demolishing the, 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 the home that is there. So finding ways to, to as Jeff said, you know, get to a yes. Um, it might be a compromise or seen as a compromise, but I feel like we need to radically embrace that housing as a right for everyone. And how do we get ourselves there to um, embrace density, even in historic districts. Thank you. Um, we have a question. Is the word preservationist, preservation, a turnoff to younger people? Is it, is it backward? Is it backward looking? Hmm. Uh, I would say in, in the experience of talking with people, I would say that it, it certainly varies. Um, there are a number of people though, who feel that the term preservation just does not reflect who we are or what we do. And the attempt to find some other way to define what it is, but to my to my knowledge, no one has quite found the exact way to uh, to do that in a way that's been um, adopted in you know in a uh, social media, for example. Um, so yes, some people consider preservation to be a term in, um, that is associated, as you saw in the presentation, associated with white supremacy, associated with systemic racism. And that, of course, is not a term that they would want to use. So I think that the approach we've taken within our organization is to see how we can redefine the word preservation uh, and using that approach to identify the, the, what we do, how we do it, and how we want to expand what we do. So I just say that that's one approach you could take. Um, we have a question about the National Register and uh, going back to the fact that the National Register seems to always be like the gateway that, that things don't happen if you're, you know, if you're not eligible. So I would say right now the process is too complicated, takes too long, takes too many resources and money, too much priestly knowledge. Until that gate can be open, we will continue to face inequities. Comments? Thoughts? Um, so yes, again, the gen amongst a lot of people that I that I spoke with, I'm just going to say that uh, that was a, a general consensus as well that the National Register of Historic Places uh, is a difficult tool and it's not an equitable tool. In that, uh, the places that may want to be listed to have access to incentives, for example, may not be able to be listed because. They were not surveyed in the first place. They have had uh, a number of changes that have been made, and now you're bumping up against the integrity criteria. So the re the requirement to have integrity and the um, the criteria don't seem to be the issue. It's really about uh, what we require people to have kept, um, and then the. Um, uh, the access to historical consultants, which as you mentioned, are expensive, and that's oftentimes what is necessary to list a place on, on the National Register. So I think our approach uh, is to look at other mechanisms uh, to identify significance. And you know, there are, there are conservation districts, of course, that have been um, discussed, but what are ways to either adapt the National Register, create a new kind of resource, um, or um, again, decouple uh, some of these incentives so that you could access them without uh, being listed in the National Register. So those are all some policy level conversations. Okay, 
Um, this is with, uh, in, with regard to the Obama Center. Precision in language is important, especially if it is going to court. Obama Center is absolutely an adverse effect under 106. Perhaps a qualifying paragraph should have been added to ensure that the precise meaning of this is understandable to the average person. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you for that. I, I couldn't agree more that I, I think the average person is not likely to go to the federal register and pick out the definitions section of that particular you know, regulation to look at the definition. So either it should be brought forward to clarify um, or to even, again, identify how to talk about that in you know, sort of plain English uh, about what, what exactly that means and why. So I, I just, it was so profound to me to be standing in that public meeting and to hear um, how, you know, how vocal people were about um, the offensiveness of this language. And it just, it hit me that at that moment, uh, how much that, that language um, is, is something that I was trained in it, you know, in my field, but uh, uh, can be offensive to somebody who's, you know, who's not doing this on a daily basis. Okay, thank you, Bonnie. I think that uh, answers all the questions. Um, we really appreciate it. We will be looking forward to what, following the process, your progress on the relevancy project. Um, Roy, did you have a question for Bonnie? You're muted. You're muted, Roy. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess actually what I was going to say is that, yeah, the National Register can be uh, a real uh, pain to deal with, but if you don't have local preservations is engaged and you don't have local preservation organizations and local preservation ordinances, then the National Register is not really gonna do that much to help your overall historic preservation program. Yeah, thank, thank you, Roy. That is certainly a, a misnomer for some people about the National Register, uh, about what it does and does not do. And I think we have a responsibility to talk about that um, because many people have just become sold on the idea that if it's listed in the register, it's never gonna be demolished. And as we know that that is not uh, the truth. We need to talk about the truth of the resources and tools that we have. Um, so thank you for that. And I'd like to echo Roy's comments. Um, many people in White Marsh thought that because the Course and Homestead was listed on the National Register, and that the district was one of the first, was the first register district in Pennsylvania, that that was all the protection we needed. It was totally useless. Um, uh, the protections that came into play were the ones available through the local historic district, district designation. And then there was also this interesting interplay between um, uh, Army Corps of Engineers finding um, of uh, with regard to water waters of the United States and the National District uh, Register listing, mm -hmm. there was the potential because it was a National Register property um, to trigger a 106 uh, investigation. Um, but um, the developers' attorneys uh, did did everything within their power to claim that it wasn't the homestead that was listed, it was just the buildings. <laughs> so um, yes, interesting little, little twist that we had to contend with. So yes, do not, I would say, do not rely on that National Register listing, although indeed there are resources that can be brought to bear, uh, grants and uh, other support uh, as a result of the listing, but getting to the point where you're listed is onerous. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, please uh, stick around for, for the overview of our 40th anniversary. Today marks the official kickoff of our 40th anniversary celebration. Throughout 2022, we'll look back at our beginnings and highlight some of our most significant successes. From our first preservation fund loan to put a roof on the William Wells Young Memorial School in York County, to a review of 30 years of our Pennsylvania at risk list, highlighting many projects that we went that went from at risk to award recipients, we're planning a series of webinars, some members only events, some special tours, and some exciting announcements. We'll be sharing our vision for the future and inviting you to be part of the planning and discussion. 
Today, we are opening applications for our 2022 Pennsylvania at risk listing. Uh, deadline is March 9th and details can be found on our website. The 2022 Pennsylvania at risk list will be announced during preservation month in May. Later in the spring, we'll open up applications for our 2022 Pennsylvania Historic Preservation Awards that will take place in the fall. This year, we'll be focusing on projects that highlight 40 years of our programs and the successes of our members and supporters. We have some exciting developments with at-risk properties that we'll be able to announce very soon after months and actually sometimes years of working behind the scenes. An example, the East Broadtop Railroad was placed on our very first Pennsylvania at risk list in 1992. It only took 28 years, but it was finally saved in 2020. So we're going to be doing a webinar with the great folks that are rebuilding this amazing National Historic Landmark. So details will be coming soon. In June, we're excited to do, some, do an event in collaboration with the Preservation League of New York State. We're going to be hosting a webinar with Dr. Whitney Martinko, who is a Villanova professor and author of Historic Real Estate, Market Morality, and the Politics of Preservation in the Early United States. Uh, Dr. Martinko is also working with one of our at-risk sites, the Carlisle Indian Industrial School in Cumberland County. If you are already a Preservation Pennsylvania member or donor, I thank you very much. We simply could not continue our work without your sustaining support. We are not funded by the state. We do not receive any operating income from large foundations or the PHMC. 65% of our operating income comes from you, people like you who value preservation's rich heritage and want to see it preserved. So if you are not yet a member, or a donor, or if your membership is lapsed, now's the perfect time to join or renew by visiting our website. Members will be receiving bi-monthly anniversary updates with exclusive opportunities to participate, join the fun, and support this important work. Please sign up for our e-news if you haven't, if you don't already receive it. I'd like to thank the members of our 40th anniversary committee, Margaret Wallace, Chair, Brenda Barrett, Caroline Boyce, Jen Burden, Julie Fitzpatrick, Darlene Heller, Melinda Meyer, Sandy Rosenberg, and Philip Zimmerman. And advisory committee members, Mary Denadi, Tom Rapon, and Paul Stanky. They are working with the board and staff to plan a great year. I look forward to celebrating with all of you. And again, congratulations to Sidel and Jeff. Thank you for all for joining us today. We have a lot of to celebrate in the coming year and we have a very bright future. We invite you to support our work, as Mindy says, through donations and membership. And we hope you will join us throughout the year as we celebrate our past and look forward to our future. Thank you again for all attending today.